This episode is brought to you by Yumiko. Your favorite dancewear brand has just launched leg warmers, and we can't wait for you to try them. Their leg warmer collection is created with a lightweight layer of the softest Italian merino wool designed to warm up your muscles without adding any extra bulk. This ultra fine knit gauge highlights the natural contours of your leg and comes in two colors to perfectly match to your leotards. Be sure to click over to yumiko.com to explore all of the world-class dancewear they have to offer. This episode is supported by the Kennedy Center. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Breeden, and you're listening to Conversations on Dance. This week's episode of Conversations on Dance was recorded live at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. Our guest is former New York City Ballet principal and artistic director of the San Francisco Ballet, Helgi Thomason. The San Francisco Ballet is performing at the Kennedy Center this week from October 23rd through the 28th. They will be performing six works that premiered earlier this year at the Unbound Festival in San Francisco. You can purchase tickets online at www.kennedy-center.org. Hi, everyone. Um, Welcome to the Kennedy Center. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, Thank you, Art, for that introduction. Um, I'm Michael Breeden. And I'm Rebecca King Ferraro, and we are former Miami City Ballet dancers and the hosts of the podcast Conversations on Dance. And we are thrilled to be here at the Kennedy Center, and we thank all of you for joining us today for this live podcast recording. And uh, we couldn't think of a better uh, guest for our first live event than to have Helgi Thomason, director of the San Francisco Ballet, with us for our first time. Thank you so much for joining us, oh, Helgi. Delighted to be here. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure most of you know that the company will be performing all week long. So this is just um, a really exciting way for us to kick off um, an incredible week of dance that hopefully you guys will all be out for. And before we get started, we want to mention that we will be opening the floor to questions afterwards. So if you have any questions that we may have missed, please feel free to bring them up at the end. So let's get started. Helgi, we want to start at the beginning. You were born in Iceland. Can you tell us a little bit about the country's history in ballet and how you became um, involved in it? Sure. There was no history of ballet (laughs) at all. Um, It happened, uh, I was about five years old. My... uh, Mother took me to see a performance of some soloists who had come from the Royal Danish Ballet. And at that time we were living, uh, it's called the Westman Islands, there are a few islands south of Iceland. Sort of fishing village, prosperous, well-to-do, but people worked hard. So she took me, and um, actually she don't pick me up in the intermission, she had gone with her twin sister. And they thought I might enjoy this. So I, I saw the second half, and don't ask me what I saw because I don't remember. <laughs> I do remember a lot of colors and music and, and, and movement. So um, apparently after that, every time I, there was music played on the radio, I was trying to imitate what I had seen. So that's how it started. I got hooked, I guess, at five years old. And, um, Later on, we moved to Reykjavik, uh, the capital. I was about nine or ten and was enrolled in a ballet school, a local ballet school, and, um, which was fun. I, I loved that sort of freedom of uh, movement within the music. Um, a year after that, uh, the National Theatre had just been built and they engaged a Danish couple to come and, and start a ballet school as part of the National Theatre which is a very sort of European way of doing things. And um, my teacher said to my mother that I should take, she should take me to, to those, that couple because they could teach me much more than they would be able to. So that's how it started. Mm-hmm. And they brought me later on to Copenhagen to study and, and to dance. So I was... How old were you when you um, decided to go to relocate to Copenhagen? Uh, they invited me... Uh, actually, first as a 10-year-old to go there and just experience it, mm. and that was f- fantastic. I, they worked both at the Pantomime Theater in Tivoli Gardens. I don't know if you know those uh, beautiful garden in, in Tivoli. There are two performances every uh, evening. First is a, a, what it's called Pantomime, which is based on the Comedy della Arte, and then there's a ballet performance after that later on. So while they were getting ready and, and performing, I was running around in this wonderful uh, Tivoli Gardens and enjoying myself. <laughs> but first time I went there, I was 15 years old mm-hmm. in the summer, uh, and I was engaged to dance in the company. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Then during the winter, I used to go back to Iceland, finish my schooling. And I did four summers like that in, in Tivoli. Yeah. Um, at 17, Jerome Robbins discovered you and arranged for a scholarship for you at the School of American Ballet. How did that come about? And what was your first interaction like with a man that you would go on to work with for many years uh, in your career? Good question. I, I had... I was going to stay in Copenhagen that whole winter and, and study and had a job with a, as a dancer in one of my musicals and the leading lady got sick so they delayed the opening. So this was in the fall so my mother said why don't you come to Iceland we won't see you otherwise for a whole year and, and so I went back to Iceland and at that same time Jerome Robbins Ballet USA was performing there and um, one of my Danish teachers, the wife, s took me to see the performance and she loved the company and she said, oh, I have to get you in there, I have to get you on as an apprentice. So she got a hold of Mr. Robbins and asked him if he could, would consider me as an apprentice. And he said, well, come and take class and I took class with the company. And, and after that he said, well, this is not a permanent company, so I, I, I don't have an apprenticeship available to you, but um, let me see what I can do. And sure enough, um, two or three more months later, I seem to remember, I got a letter from him saying, come to New York, I have arranged for you to come to the School of American Ballet to study for a year, so it would be good for you. And that's how it started. Mm. What was that class like for you? Was that really intimidating when well, you took I, I was, I was uh, practically tearing the backdrop apart <laughs> because I was always in the back. And <laughs> was it Jerry no, teaching? Jerry was teaching, oh, okay. yes. And... Um, Actually, one of the, the dancers in the company sort of said, hey, he's watching you, so come here. And they took me by the hand and put me uh. all up in front. Uh, that was a little scary, but it was nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, what was that year like at SAB then? How, how was the training um, different from what you were receiving in Copenhagen? Or um, did you have any sort of culture shock to deal with coming from such a different... Um uh, in a way I did, because I had studied, um, when I was in Denmark dancing every night, um, obviously I could use a lot of improvement yet, so mm -hmm. there was a, a private school called the Bartolin mm -hmm. Academy, mm -hmm. and I took classes there every day. So when I came to New York, it was much more structured, it was... Um, um, more disciplined, it was harder, um, and I learned a lot. Uh, but I, I sort of, I wish at that time that there had been more classes available, mm -hmm. because there was only one class a day, and um, sometime during the week there was, an, let's say, a, a, a da show class or something mm -hmm. like that. So there I was, didn't know anybody, um, didn't have a lot of money, <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there was a lot of time just to to kill. Mm -hmm. And 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 I walked all over New York and Manhattan. I got to know it very well. And, mm -hmm. and eventually you meet with other students and, and they're very nice and invite you to come to their places and have dinner. Yeah. And so that was nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So who were some of your teachers in those days? Uh, Stanley wasn't at the school yet. Uh, yes, Stanley came at the same time I did. Oh, he did? Stanley okay. Williams, yeah. And Obukov was there, and Vladimirov, both Russian. Mm -hmm. And um, Obukov was sort of the scary one. <laughs> There's he, always one. <laughs> he was, he's, you thought he was so mean and, and strict. And, and once you realized months later that he wasn't, he just liked to intimidate you a little bit. <laughs> so, um, Iklevsky taught once in a while. But those were my teachers at that time. Uh, at this point, were you um, aware of how connected the, the school was to the company, the New York City Ballet? Were you um, able to see performances from that time? Yes, um, obviously, you know, there was dancers from the company would come to take, take class. classes at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so I, I got to see a, quite a few performances at City Center, where they some of the dancers sort of sneak me in mm -hmm. <laughs> because I didn't have the money to pay for the ticket, mm -hmm. and they didn't have many extra tickets to, to give to the students. But I managed to see it, right. see a lot. Yeah. yeah. So you went on to join the Joffrey Ballet as your first um, entrance into the professional dance world. So how did that come about, coming from SAB and joining Joffrey? Well, 
I came about because um, Robbins was getting ready, ready to go to Europe again with his Ballet USA, and he was having auditions. So he wanted me to show up in the auditions, and I remember it was in some Broadway theater. I think there was at least 200 answers. And um, the movement was different than what I was you know, used to, but it was okay. Mm -hmm. And there were elimination, elimination, and he kept me all the time, and mm -hmm. I ended up being one of five in the end. And, um, and then he said to me, no, um, I'm not gonna take you with us on, on tour because I think it'd be much better for you to um, study more, but also your strength is more in the classical dance, sure. the classical ballet. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, of course, very disappointed, but I went back to Denmark. I had a job offer with the Pantomime Theater. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met Eric Brun. And he said, no, you, you have to go back to, to America because the future in dance is in America. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was very, very generous. He wrote a couple of letters, one to Lucia Chase and one to Joffrey. And he said, that's an introductory letter. Mm -hmm. um, when I got back to New York, um, Ballet Theater had just hired a male dancer, so they didn't need anyone else. And so that's how I ended up in Joffrey. He mm -hmm. took me, yeah. We talk a lot about how now um, students at SAB really are focused on getting into New York City Ballet. Was it like that for you in your time? Like, were you really wanting to join that company or? Yes, I thought I would, yeah. you know. Uh, and the uh, same thing happened at that time. You know, I, I let it be known I was very interested mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. getting into the company. and. And there was no position available at that time. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it took me nine years to get back. <laughs> but then I came back as a principal dancer, so that uh, kind of worked all out. Were you very disappointed, I'm sure, when it didn't work out in the beginning, at least? Yeah, yeah you're disappointed, mm -hmm. but you know, that's but, how it is. Yeah. And then you had this exciting new uh, position um, working for Joffrey. So um, while you were there, um, was he creating a lot or...? Um, what was your experience like with the company? Um, we actually, I, I went straight into a, a 10 week one night stand tour. Oh, wow. By bus, which either kills you or makes you very strong. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we did three of those while wow. I was with Joffrey. And he was choreographing a little bit and uh, he was bringing in repertory, but basically it was, we were about, what, roughly about 25 dancers, and every night we danced in a different place. Mm -hmm. For 10 weeks and there was nothing about if you were sick you danced mm -hmm. there was okay. nobody to cover you mm -hmm. so that's um, it was quite a, a great experience mm -hmm. and I got to see the United States right <laughs> <laughs> so that was your first real introduction then to company life or did you have some substantial time in the studios and performing with Joffrey it was just right away going this was on just tour. right away yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. wow. So uh, not too long thereafter, Rebecca Harkness uh, began her own company, and um, many of the dancers of the Joffrey, yourself included, decided to come along. Um, what made you want to take a risk joining a, a company in an inaugural season like that? Well, first of all, Mrs. Harkness came in to sponsor Joffrey. Mm -hmm. So she underwrote all the expenses and everything. That went on for two years. And then they had a disagreement or... I had the feeling it was more her attorneys mm. that suggested if she was paying all the bills, the, the company should be named Harkness Ballet and not Joffrey. And Bob would not stand for that. So he said, no way. So he left. And, you know, dancers, as you know, we don't make much money. So mm. you need to go where the job is. The right. Money. And, yeah. <laughs> and Mrs. Harkness offered to, you know, your job to go with, with her company and it all sounded promising, and, and we knew who she was because she had been around us mm -hmm. for two years. Mm -hmm. So that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. Was touring still a, a part of your life at that point? Was she eager to keep that element? Oh, yeah, going? we toured. My God, we toured. We, we spent... Um, one tour was nine months <gasps> in Europe. Wow. Nine months? Nine months. We started in um, Portugal and... December, by Christmas, we were in Beirut, Lebanon. Oh and from goodness. there we went to, um, let me see, uh, Damascus. We went to uh, Amman, Jordan. We went to uh, uh, Tehran. Um, 
But these were not all one night stands. No, or- those. Were, <laughs> and, and also, I should say, when you say nine months, it was we were all stationed, um, sort of permanent base in Monte Carlo, mm. where we used to rehearse and take classes and oh. create new works, mm-hmm. and then we would they sort of go to France, you know, or Belgium or Holland or mm-hmm. Italy, and all wow. this back. But the tour itself was nine months altogether. Mm-hmm. And then we did a seven-week uh, tour in Russia. We did seven weeks in India. So we toured a lot. And all these were sponsored by State Department at that time. Wow. That's so crazy so. to think about because it's so unlike um, yeah. today's yeah. culture for, for oh. ballet. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? You must oh, have. Well, we loved it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Loved it. yeah. Saw the whole world. Different audiences and, and seeing different cultures. and, and, and mm. Yeah. What was the most surprising um, tour stop for you? Uh, what 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 um, what place that you visited were you just surprised by the reaction of the people or the culture? Uh, most of all, well, there are many th- things I can think of. Um, I remember in in, in um, Damascus, the theater we performed in was um, the stage was slightly raked, meaning it, it slants, and as you know, it slants forward because in in in, uh, in Europe at that time the audience always sat on the flat and the, that's why they tilted the stage so they could see so we except in Damascus it was raked the other way <gasps> so, <laughs> so we, we, we were dancing you know, trying oh, to get oh. to the audience all night long like and, up a hill that's yeah so up crazy. a hill um, I think uh, one of my most memorable experiences was when we went to um, Kabul, Afghanistan on that tour because Mr. Joffrey's father was Afghan, so it meant a lot to him to go there. And um, at that time, this is in in the 60s, the Cold War, and um, the United States is giving the country certain things and and Russia is giving them certain things, and so the Russians had built them a theater. Um, quite nice. When we got there, this was in the middle of January, and it's awfully cold there at that time. Except we were told that the Russians forgot to put the heating system in. So there was no heat in the theater. And it was so cold that it was, we tried to warm up, and it's the only time I've danced on stage where I couldn't feel my toes, they were numb. And the linoleum, just buckled and cracked mm. because of the cold weather. Yeah. Um, and we danced. You know, Joffrey said, "You have to go and dance. You have oh. to go." And, and we were just freezing. And um, oh, no. it was packed theater, and you know, we didn't hear any applause or anything. People, <laughs> uh, you know, we realized they all had their gloves on. Mm-hmm. So this, we heard this instead of that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, no, that was, I won't forget that one. That was, <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. that's hysterical. Um, so moving on, like you just mentioned, you jo- joined New York City Ballet in 1970 yeah. at the age of 28. Mm-hmm. Um, Balanchine invited you as a principal. So how yeah. did that come about? Uh, Harkness Ballet was in, on tour in Europe and we were, I think, in Barcelona. And... Um, Unfortunately, as well-meaning Mrs. Harkness was uh, about the company, she adored the dancers, would do anything for them. Uh, by that time, she was bringing in another director, and this was the seventh one. Wow. In, in, in a space of like six years or something like that. Wow. So I went to Mrs. Harkness and said, no, I, that's it, I, I can't do this anymore. Um, so I'm not going to sign on for next year, mm-hmm. I'm quitting. And I left, uh, not knowing what I was going to do, where I was going to go, and this company sort of folded. And I guess that was the news in New York, so I got a telegram from Balanchine's assistant, Barbara Horgan, and she said, when you come to New York, come and see me right away. So that's how that ended up, that I went to see Mr. B, and uh, he said, if you have nothing to do, come and take classes. Uh (laughs) It's typical understatement, and... Mm -hmm. um, and I took classes for a week, and then one day one of the ladies in the corps, who I had known from the school earlier, mm-hmm. 
She said, oh, congratulations, congratulations. And, and, and I said, about what? She said, well, you're in the company, don't you know? I said, no, nobody told me. <laughs> so, so she said, well, go and see the, the company manager, um, Betty Cage. And I went down there and knocked on the door and said, and I said, is this true that I'm in the company? Oh, yeah, no, I forgot. Nobody told you, did they? So that's how I got into New York City Ballet as a principal dancer. <laughs> how was Balanchine aware of your dancing um, enough to invite you? Um, he, well, he had seen me um, apparently with Harkness mm -hmm. when we danced one year on Broadway, in the Broadway theater, I should mm -hmm. say. And, um, of course, Jerry Robbins was very much part of the New York City Ballet and, and um, knew of me because he had given me permission to, to use one of his uh, solos from the dances at a gathering when I went to the Moscow competition. Uh, so he was very much aware of what was happening to me and I think he spoke to Balanchine. Mm -hmm. And matter of fact, when, when he had given me permission to use one of his solos from dances at a gathering for the Moscow competition, um, he said, me, had, come to the theater, come to the state theater, and, and let me see what you've done, because I had learned the solo, and, and he wanted to see what, what it looked like. And apparently, I remember he was sitting with somebody whom I didn't know at that time who it was, but it was Lincoln Kirstein. And um, apparently, he is the one who said, this, this dancer has to be in this company. Uh -huh. and, uh, that's how it came about. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the first roles that Balanchine put you in once you had been accepted into the company? The very first thing was Third Moon Symphony in C. Yeah. Did he work with you personally on that? Yeah, yeah. Um, typical sort of last minute. Uh -huh. I mean, day of the performance. Oh. <laughs> he's, he's seeing me for the first time correcting. And um, I should tell you also that he had a way of testing dancers, what they were made of. And... Um, which I didn't know at that time, but in Symphony in C, third moment, you sort of come running in from the front wing and you go into big leaps around. And Balanchine usually always was um, on that side of the stage. But this night, he decided to be on this side of the stage, right in the first wing where I had to come in. <laughs> and I have to show you what, what he looked like. <laughs> He's, He's demonstrating for us. And he sort of has his leg out like this. <laughs> and I have to come running it. And, <laughs> and, and he just very calm is like this and wanted to know what I was doing. So I had to run and jump over his leg. And you know, I said, I can dare to hit him. <laughs> and that was his way of seeing, would it rattle me or would I break down or you know, would I panic? I didn't. So Damn that was, he did that to a lot of dancers. That was his way of, if it... If it was not going to work, he wanted to know right away. You know, mm. he was too busy to try to amend things and fix things. Either you have it in you or you don't. Mm. So, so uh, obviously, he felt you, he, you had it in him yourself because he <laughs> continued uh, shortly after joining. He started making ballets for you. Yes. Um, one of the ballets that um, you were in the original cast of is the Masterpiece Symphony in Three Movements. Symphony in um, Three Movements, yes. Made in 1972, and you were the original jump boy, as we yep. call it. Yep. Um, what was that process like? Uh, it's such a complicated ballet. Um, what, what was the rehearsal process like with Balanchine? Well, I, I have to tell you that coming into New York City Ballet, there was a lot of Stravinsky music played, played and that was not the easiest thing, thing for me to, come, uh, to adjust to because mm -hmm. I was not used to it. And... Um, Symphony Three Movements is, is that. And, yeah. and Balanchine didn't like you to count the music unless you absolutely had to. He said, just listen, because one day the conductor is going to go faster or slower, and you have to know where you are. If you count and, and the music is going in one way and you are counting another way, you're not going to get to be together. So you have to learn to listen to the music, because that's how he choreographed. He never gave you the counts. Unless you absolutely insist, they say, can you just tell me, is that on two or one or whatever? Um, so um, that particular role was, uh, for some reason, he kept changing it. 
which was very unusual for Balanchine. He usually, in, uh, when he was choreographing in a studio, the first thing he showed you to do, what to do, that's what stayed. You know, like he knew what he wanted and saw in his head what he wanted. Uh, well, in this case, it wasn't. You know, he kept changing it, and I, I thought maybe it's me, and I, and I went up to him and said, am I, "What am I doing wrong?" He said, "No, no, no, it's just me." He said, "I, I just," he, he couldn't find it. Um, but he found it. But he found it. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, there's something that I have been dying to ask you about for a long time, actually, because. Um, I got to dance the jump couple and I went to the library to do some research for it, the Jerome Robbins Library in New York. And they have the second performance ever of Somebody in Three is on a, a reel and there's no music. Oh, really? Oh, um, okay. And so I went to go watch it and then I see that the ballet started at that point completely differently um, in one way than it's done now. The jump boy has an extensive solo that I had never seen in my life, yeah. where, um, I mean, at one point you do menage through the girls, yes. you do alcicon turns, yeah. it's a lot more material than this role now has. So, and for one, A, how did you get through the ballet if you had to do that? <laughs> and B, what was that, um, did, when was it cut after you or while you were still in the ballet? Um, why, why do you think he made that particular change? He made some adjustments while I was still dancing, or mm -hmm. we were still dancing it, but not that major. So maybe that came later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never. I don't know that anyone else ever did that. So yeah, I, think I had it would never be seen it till we watched it. Too. An interesting yeah. um, thing to see in the ballet again, because it's almost it's like four counts into the ballet, yeah. you burst out of the wing, yes. and normally there's a lot more of those That's the right. sixteen yes. girls in that yes. iconic image. Yeah. So was that that was something he was just tweaking and couldn't. He didn't feel like he was getting right. For whatever reason, mm -hmm. that he didn't feel it was right for him mm -hmm. as a choreographer. Right. So. Yeah. Balanchine was um, notoriously vague in rehearsals. He wouldn't necessarily give a lot of coaching and direction. So was there anything in specific that you can remember that he talked about in Symphony in Three Movements that maybe was like a point of departure or something that you remember being inspired by for that ballet? No, not so much in that ballet. I mean, it was... It's so complex, mm -hmm. and, and the music is difficult, and how he captures that is incredible. Um, and to have everybody involved in the ballet there in the studio, it's a lot of people, so mm -hmm. he, it's like he didn't take the time to tell each individual or what he was wanting or whatever. Right. He just showed it, and that's what he wanted, and mm -hmm. you, know, you do it. Mm -hmm. And if he didn't like the way you did it in either he would say, no, I want it this way, or maybe sometimes he just changed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, another ballet that he created that same year um, with you in the lead was the, the Baiser de la Fée. Yes. And he had done that as a story ballet. Um, it's a Stravinsky score it meant to have a, a narrative accompanying it. Um, he had tried it, I think, two or three times, and it wasn't really working out to his satisfaction. So he dispensed to the story altogether and did just the divertimento from the from Baiser de la Fée with yourself and uh, Patricia McBride. Correct. Yeah. So uh, what was the process like for that particular ballet? It was being made at the same time as Symphony in Three Movements? Mm -hmm. um, did he give you more of a background actually, for that? Actually, it was not ballet? at the same time. It was for the same festival. Same, mm -hmm. fe same festival. But right. actually, Basie was the first ballet he started with in the festival. For the whole festival. Oh. Oh. And, um, um, you know, he he's quick. He was very quick of choreographing. Mm -hmm. And he didn't linger or... He always seemed to know exactly what he wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I did not have a solo in there, and I was a little disappointed, but that's how he sees the work. Mm -hmm. And it was not until much later, uh, just before the festival opened, that um, uh, on the call board, <clears throat> they see my, uh, my name is up there, with Balanchine, based at De La Fay, uh, and without Patty. Um, so I asked uh, Gordon Balsner, who was the pianist, mm -hmm. I said, uh, do you know what this is about? He said, well, he will tell you. <laughs> so I came up to the studio and, and he said, well, I found some music. <laughs> I think it'd be nice if you had a solo. <laughs> and it's for, he said, I can't remember what I did originally in Bays 8, but there was something by the, with a woman sitting over a crystal ball and you know, making predictions and whatever. So maybe that's why it's rather mysterious, this whole... Mm -hmm. And he started, and I could barely keep up with him. And this solo, which people have written saying it's probably the greatest solo he's ever created for a male dancer, mm -hmm. 
Well, he did that in one hour and 20 minutes. Oh my gosh. Which is just unbelievable. Mm -hmm. um, to the point that it was less than one hour and 20 minutes because he said, to, okay, rest a minute, think about it. <laughs> and I tried to think of every, all, everything, all the steps he had given me. He said, okay, let's see it. So I ran it through and I probably made not any mistakes according to him. And he said, okay, good, you work on it. And that was it. Mm -hmm. Until the day of the performance, we had a dress rehearsal in the afternoon. And it came to the solo, he said, okay, let's see. And I did it and he said, good, good. And that was it. <laughs> So you never rehearsed it again until right before the show? That was it? Not with him, no. Not with him. Only on my own. Right, right, right. Yeah. But like, what if you didn't remember something properly and you messed up the well, choreography? That, that was too bad for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. So it was really, he came in with a very clear vision of what he wanted for that, or was there a little back and forth collaborative? Well, there was, there was. You know, he said, what, do, try something like this, because he couldn't really demonstrate fully what he wanted. He, a lot of verbal things. Mm -hmm. And I would show something that I thought he meant. He said, yes, and can you, in the air, can you twist the other way? And, and, and the, 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 that. Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah, we worked together on this. Mm -hmm. kind right. of. So uh, both Symphony in Three Movements and Bays of Delafe were made for um, the 1972 Stravinsky Festival, which is you know one of the most important events in the company's entire history. But um, it wasn't without its stresses, right? So there were 22 <laughs> ballets, I think, that were being I made? I think it was 22 ballets. 22, yeah. and um, they were all premiering within just one week. And I've heard stories about um, rehearsals happening in hallways. And you I know, think it was more than one week, as you remember. Was, okay. Yeah, I think so. so. But a compact But they were not all by balancing. There were, right. There was Robbins, and there was um, uh, John Tarras, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. John Clifford, uh, I think, and um, yeah. It was, it was a number of, of choreographers, yeah. but, and of course, balancing always gave other people priority, right? He, he yeah. was, he was uh, yeah. not as concerned yeah. with his own works as letting, as letting uh, other people have their time. But um, it must have been a, a sort of a hectic time uh, being around all of that creation. How did that affect your um, job as a performer? Uh, well, first of all, as a dancer, you love being in something that's being created for you. Mm -hmm. Um, it always means something special. Uh, so for me, being in those two ballets was something special. And yet, you know, you go out and look at what everybody else is doing, mm -hmm. and you realize this incredible uh, creative mind that put all this together and, and choreographed so many ballets, and they're all so different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Violin, Concerto, Symphony in Three Movements, Beze, and there are many, many others. So. Mm -hmm. You said that it's so special to have a ballet made on you. What is it like now for you to sit in the audience and watch other dancers doing roles that you originated? Um, I'm happy for them you know, because, I mean, in my mind, and you might not agree, I think Balanchine is probably one of the, the, the genius of, of choreography. Oh, we really agree. You know? <laughs> um, <laughs> to, to dance his ballets, and I tell my dancers the same thing, it's a privilege to be able to dance those ballets and be allowed to dance them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's something really, really special. Um, they are so musical, they are so logical. Um, he used to say, you know, you should, you should see the music through the dance, through the movement. And, and you feel like that when you dance it. If you, you mm -hmm. feel that you are so in, in tune with the music that you feel completely together. You know. mm -hmm. So he, Ballantine was very well known for his neoclassical works like Agon and mm -hmm. Fortis that have no narrative, but he also was a great storyteller with yes. um, full-length ballets, one of which was Coppelia that he created the lead roles for you and Patricia McBride. So how was that process a little bit different than something like Symphony in Three Movements, working with him, kind of getting some of that story involved in the movement? Well, he had uh, Danilova there with him mm. working and she remembered a lot of the, of the mime scenes mm. from her time in Russia. So she took care of that and he would sort of fill in choreographically what, they, what he wanted to fill in. And mm -hmm. um, It was always a pleasure working with him. He was so easy to work with. Um, he never raised his voice or anything. It just, you know, 
this is what he wanted and let me show me this do this and um, it was great mm-hmm. um, a, a little similar thing happened in um, in the last third act he said um, I need a solo for you and I said great <laughs> 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 um, and then he said you danced Sylvia Parada that I created a long time ago on Iglevsky. I said, yes. Do you remember it? And we were in the studio up in, in Saratoga because we were getting ready to perform the ballet. Mm-hmm. And I said, yes. Show me. So he had the pianist play that um, mm-hmm. music from Sylvia Parada, same composer. So I did it and he said, good, wonderful, let's do that. That was it. <laughs> So it was it was one of his, and I guess he he said he said to me once, never waste anything. When I was starting choreographing, he said, never waste anything. If you feel it doesn't work here, try something else. But don't forget about it because you might be able to use it at another time. Right. Hmm. So, so uh, he paired you with Patricia McBride once again um, in Vienna Waltzes yeah. uh, for the Voices of Spring section. Um, that ballet is it was a huge box office hit you yes. have the sort of um stylized social dances the waltz and the polka mm-hmm. but you and and patty were doing still straight up classical virtuoso dancing she's still in point shoes not in heels why do you think he chose to make your section um different from the rest of the ballet he never explained it uh, to us but i think um Again, you know, I think he would t- he would have said most likely that's what the music tells me mm-hmm. I have to do. You know, that was not unusual for him to say. You know, this mm-hmm. is this is what the music tells me to do. This is what I feel. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So we've talked a little bit about your um, partnership with Patricia McBride. Mm-hmm. Um, what is it? Do you think about your um, partnership on stage that worked so well for both of you, but also for Balanchine and for the audiences? Oh. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, I think it's what's important in a partnership that um, the male and the female they go well together mm. visually to look at uh, and I think in, in our case we both really love to dance um, and there were many times on stage when, when I was dancing with Patty she was just almost humming the music while I'm dancing with her in the pas de deux and almost singing it out because she was so happy mm. uh, and um, <laughs> that, that in itself you know it's it carries over to your partner, and, mm-hmm. and um, we got along fabulously. We, we um, seem to have sort of the same work ethics, and yeah. maybe that's what it was that he saw in us, mm-hmm. because Jerry used, used us also together right. a lot. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a, a wonderful way to transition, because we got to get Jerry in here somewhere, right? <laughs> so you, you you had the opportunity to work for not only one genius at the New York City Valley, but two. Yes. So uh, what was your artistic relationship, your working relationship like with Jerry? And uh, what were some of the most memorable um, times you had with him in terms, in terms of his coaching? And um, uh, Well, Jerry uh, Robbins and Balanchine were very different people. Um, like I said, with Balanchine, usually when he was choreographing, the first thing he would show you would be the same thing that ended up on, on the stage. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robbins was not like that. He would um, change his mind, no, no, I don't like that, let's start again. Um, and there was one particular ballet that I remember that um, he kept changing it day after day. There was a different version of that 16 counts or whatever it was and and I don't know what I what, why but I had seemed to have that ability that um, he would say to me show me that third version we did three days ago and I could remember that <laughs> fortunately for me because he would say that to somebody else and they couldn't remember he would just blow us back yeah, man. Right. because he couldn't remember it but he expected <laughs> us to remember it <laughs> And to do so many different versions to the same music and then say, no, it doesn't work for him. 
let's do something else, and you start again. Um, so in that way, um, and maybe partly is that he felt sort of responsible for me bringing me to America. Um, and of course, I sort of looked at him as my mentor, that I think, honestly, I saw dancers be very frightened of him in, in the studios because he could lose his temper and you did not want to be the one in the studio that was being picked on by General Robbins. And yet, with Patty McBride and myself, we seemed to be able to do nothing wrong. I mean, Patty would do something and make mistakes and he would just laugh. <laughs> he would say, well, that's funny. And anybody else would have done that, he would have been furious. Mm. So, um, in one way, uh, you know, I, I loved working with him. Um, I don't know how to s say that without sounding stupid. Or, you know, I think I had, I heard music probably the same way Jerry heard music. The way he phrased music for me was so natural that um, I seem to be able to pick that up right away. And maybe mm -hmm. that's what he saw in me. I don't know. Your minds worked similarly. I don't know if I mind. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been nice. <laughs> but um, at, at least I think musically we heard music the same way. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you began choreographing yourself um, at the School of American Ballet. And that ballet went on to be added to the New York City Ballet repertoire. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've gone on to create many works for San Francisco Ballet and other companies. Was that something you were always interested in doing? Or was that something that maybe Balanchine saw in you? Robin no, um, you? you know, it's so intimidating uh, to be in New York City Ballet at that time with Balanchine and Robin creating at least two works each every year. Mm -hmm. You know, what am I going to do? You know, <laughs> when you have those two geniuses and you want to be in those ballets. So yeah. that was the main thing. Uh, it sort of came about by accident. I was asked to participate in a, in a pilot for ABC. Uh, they wanted to do a variety show. Um, I guess they were competing with Ed Sullivan. Uh, you probably don't know wh who Ed Sullivan <laughs> is. But, <laughs> but it was, uh, so they approached me and if I could dance in a, in, in a solo in there, and I said, fine. So I said, uh, who, who's gonna be choreographing it? And they said, you are. Hmm? You're a dancer. Can't you choreograph it? So <laughs> that's how I sort of had my first experience of putting some steps to the music. Mm -hmm. And I found out that uh, it intrigued me. I, I kind of uh, liked it. I have no idea what it looked like. It wasn't probably very good. But <laughs> the pilot was not bought by uh, ABC, so it was dropped. So that never went anywhere. But <laughs> It started my uh, interest in choreography, and so I finally went to Balanchine at one point, and um, actually my wife said to me, uh, if you are gonna choreograph, you better get on right now because you're getting older. <laughs> and um, so I went to see Balanchine and asked him, and he said, sure, absolutely. And he said, why don't you go to the, the school and work with the top students at the school? Of course, I had thought I was gonna get company dancers, you know. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, no, you, you, you will learn so much from that because you will discover you have to show them what you want them to do. And you will learn from that and they will learn from you. Whereas a professional dancer will come to you and say, oh, I can do this. Do you want me to do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I can show you something like that. And if you say yes, do that. And you're no longer a choreographer. You are not being the one who is choreographing it. So he really encouraged me to use the students, which I did. Mm -hmm. And eventually I choreographed for the company, but that's how I started. Right. And it was true, I learned so much from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Peter Bowl was in that first ballet. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in 1985, almost immediately following your retirement, you took over as director uh, of the San Francisco Ballet. A week later. Yeah. A week later. <gasps> wow. We were thinking like a couple months. Yeah. No? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so how did you set that up so um, tightly like that? I mean, what, how did the company approach you? Or um, Actually, uh, I had decided to to stop dancing. I felt it was time and I didn't want to 
hated the idea that people say, oh, too bad, Helgi, he was, he was very good at one time, and look at him now, wow, <laughs> you know, and I didn't like that idea. So um, I started cutting down on, on certain roles that I felt that somebody else should do now. And uh, out of nowhere came an offer from the Royal Danish Ballet to come to Copenhagen to take over the company there as a director. And I thought, fine, I, I speak Danish, why not? I studied there. So I went over there and talked to them, and they offered me the company. Uh, I felt there was a lot of issues that need to be corrected first. Uh, it, had, it had to do with union issues of dancers, and you know, they, I think they finished at 2.30 in the afternoon, regardless of the performances or not, and I said, you, you need to have more time too for creating things, and um, they yeah. wouldn't change. So I went back and, uh, to New York. Um, I get a call from Lou Christensen, who was director of San Francisco Ballet, and he said, uh, I want you out here, and I want to show you what I have, the company. I really would like you to take over, and, and and I said, I'm very flattered, but I have an offer from Copenhagen. I'm actually I'm due to go back tomorrow, I think it was, mm -hmm. to sign my contract. And he said, stall them, stall them. Don't, don't sign anything. Uh, let me show you first what I have. Um, I said, well, I might not be able to do that. So I went to Copenhagen. Um, again, there was difficulties, and, and I said, uh, they said, no, no, you come, come, we will fix it. Come here and we will fix things. And I said, no, you fix it first and then I'll come. And they wouldn't do that. So I went back to New York and I saw Lou Christensen. I read in the New York Times that he had just passed away. So I didn't give it any more thought. Uh, within a few days, I got a call from the search committee. They knew that he had contacted me and asked me to come to San Francisco and, and talk to them, which I did. I felt I owed Lou that and I did. Um, and Copenhagen was drifting farther and further away, and uh, so I said, okay, and they offered me San Francisco Ballet, and I mm -hmm. took it. What was it about the company that attracted you? Did, did you, um, you felt you had an affinity for it? Many mm -hmm. things. I felt that the dancers were very committed. Uh, um, there was talent, young talent there. Um, they had just built this new building with new studios. It was the first building in the, the sort of the ballet world in, in America that had, they had built studios for the company. There were like seven studios. Um, and I felt it was a commitment to really support this. And um, yeah, I thought, why not? I mean, and, and Robin said to me, don't forget about Copenhagen, stay, stay in America. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very generous with me. He said, you can have any ballet of mine, whatever you want, let me know. That's great. So that was, you know, that's a, quite an incentive to, to stay right. over a yeah. company. <laughs> <laughs> what were some of your initial plans for the company once you got there, and how did you start to implement those plans? Um, well, there had been, and I don't want to go into that in detail, but there had been mm -hmm. problems with uh, the co-director, with, with Lou, with uh, Michael Smuin, and the company, the board did not want him, and so they did not engage him. And that was problematic for me because um, uh, a lot of the repertoire that he wanted, I didn't agree with. Mm -hmm. So um, I felt that we needed to sort of, like I said at that time, sort of open up the windows and let some fresh air in and let's get some choreographer from outside, mm -hmm. which I did. And coming from New York City Ballet, where so much creative thing were happening all the time, uh, I felt that was important to sort of continue on that basis. And don't forget, when I was with Joffrey, Robert Joffrey was the first one to invite uh, choreographers from the modern dance community to choreograph on Joffrey dancers. Mm -hmm. There was Alvin Ailey. Alvin Ailey did two or three works for us. Uh, John Butler, Anna Sokolov, who was really very modern. <laughs> um, so I was, I had grown up with that from Joffrey days and continue with New York City Ballet of creating things new work, always look for something in the future. We can't just dwell on what's in the past. Mm -hmm. So I, I wanted the company in San Francisco to do the same thing without making it like second New York City Ballet because we would always be a, just a, a bad copy. Mm -hmm. 
So I used my experience of what I had experienced with Joffrey and New York City Ballet to to uh, insist on uh, a more rigorous training. I put the ladies in point shoes in class because I felt their point work, work was not that great. Mm. Um, and uh, there were some dancers there that what happens to dancers, they come to an end of their career, they should step aside. And and that's most, my most difficult things to do as a director is to let dancers go. But if only dancers were so clever, they, they knew exactly when to step aside. <laughs> <laughs> but most dancers don't do it like that. And um, so I had to let, uh, like, I think it was seven dancers go. So they sued me. So I had to go to court. And so yeah. some, some rocky <laughs> beginnings, but then from there, I, what I think is so interesting is that you're, you're saying that from the very beginning, you had this idea that um, you, the company needed to foster new choreographic talents and that that would feed the audience and the dancers. And that's literally why we're sitting here today is because the company has brought um, one half of the, the ballets that were produced for the Unbound Festival yep. in April, which uh, featured 12 premieres by 12 different choreographers. Um, how have you managed to keep that as a, a sort of underlying theme for the company, that, th that this new work is what's going to feed the dancers? And I think it has a lot to do with, uh, with Joffrey. Mm -hmm. uh, he sort of instilled in us those two years that I worked with him that um, how important it was to look ahead and, and, and find out what's, what's in the future. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, I mean, I love uh, the classics. I love the, the Swan Lake and the Giselles and Sleeping Beauty and, you know, um, and we do those ballets. And it's important for dancers to dance those ballets. But we cannot only just keep doing the same old ballets again. Mm -hmm. It's going to be museum pieces and people are going to get uh, bored with it. So I always tried to um, emphasize that the company was searching for new works and some will work and some will not work. I mean, that's, you take that chance. But uh, it's always been there and I did a, at one point I did, um, I invited um, companies from around the world to bring with them a new work to San Francisco. It was called but the um, United We Dance. It was celebrating the, the signing of the Charter of uh, United Nations, which was signed at our opera house in San Francisco. Mm. So I think I invited like 13 foreign companies to bring a new work with them that they had choreographed at home, bringing it to San Francisco and premiering it there. That was interesting. <laughs> um, I have done something called a, a New Works Festival where I had like 10 choreographers but there were a lot of them sort of in-house where I was trying to, to help and, and uh, promote uh, this time I did Unbound and um, there were 12 choreographers and I just told them from the beginning um just go with the title, Unbound, meaning you can do anything you want. Think of something that you've been dying to choreograph but haven't been able to until now because sometimes when companies engage the choreographers, they say, oh, I need a, an opening ballet or I need a closing ballet. I don't like that music. Do this, do this for me or whatever. And this time I said, no, no, you create, you have free, freedom to create whatever you want. I want to see, I want to see where dance is going the young sought after choreographers today what what are they thinking what because the whole world is changing we know that and dance is changing and and i just wanted to know what they're thinking what not that i expected to have a definitive answer where we're all heading in dance but i know we are it's changing and i just wanted to have an opportunity to provide my dancers to experiencing that and, and uh, the audience in San Francisco to take a look at 12 different ways of, of looking at, at ballet or dance, or however, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So um, many of them were surprised. You mean I can do anything I want? I said, yes. <laughs> so rare. And, and Kristen Wielden said to me, okay, I've never done a ballet for ladies in, in flat shoes. I want to do that. 
not in point shoes. Okay, fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so there were things like that that mm-hmm. happened. Um, Arthur Peter was uh, actually he's South African, but he lives in London. Uh, he wanted to do use music of Björk, which is an Icelandic pop singer, but he couldn't get the permission to do it. So I used my influence and uh, wrote her a letter and, <laughs> <laughs> and said, yeah, I have this choreographer who really would like to do something to your music. Mm. I would hope you would give him permission. And, and this music that she had composed, it's not only songs, but also... Uh, and we got the permission the day before. It was sort of deadline. Either we, we go with it or we can't. Uh-huh. Right, right. So, but that's, that was part of the f- festival. Just try something that they had never done before. And, um, or if you want to do something you had done before, and uh, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But, you know, challenge yourself. Show us what you're thinking, what, where you think dance is going. Mm-hmm. And right now, from the festival, it's going <laughs> which is nice. Well, we were lucky enough to see some of the works that premiered out there um, when we were um, out in San Francisco in April. So uh, we know that everyone is going to have um, a really unique experience with these works. Um, we were completely blown away. So we're so happy it's making its way to the East Coast. Yes. Well, I'm um, very happy to bring it, bring it here because I think it, it was... How can I say this myself since I came up with the idea? <laughs> it really worked. I mean, the, the audience just loved it. There was standing room every night. Mm-hmm. And the opera house seats 3,200 people. Um, to the point that since then, I still hear people come, up, well, come to me and say, are you going to do it again next year? And I said, no, I can't, because it took two and a half years to get this going. <laughs> You know, plan it. It's a lot. Choreographers, funding, all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But well, we hope that it comes back for sure. Absolutely. We'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you will see a, a, a very diverse way of, of looking at dance, and they are each unique. Each what I've, I've brought here. It's mm-hmm. it's. I'm not saying you're going to like everything. Of course not. You know, I wouldn't dream of it. But wow. Just to see that creative minds, it's it's wonderful, and you know, no way is dance dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that that concludes our section of the questioning. If anybody else in the audience has some questions for Helgi, not right now. Yes. Yeah. Right. Can you walk us through a day in the director's life on tour? Um, let's say it's tomorrow, for example. Yeah. Tell us what your day is like. Well, we all arrived yesterday. Oh. So t- <laughs> today has to be a, a, a free day for the dancers by union regulations. Uh, there is, I can't demand that they do a class. So I call it a mandatory optional class. <laughs> 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 And uh, so they come in and they work, and, and it's better. Some did some of the rehearsal on their own, but tomorrow we will get into the theater. And that's, this is what's difficult, to set everything up. My, my crew is setting up the stage right now, but we have a, a dress rehearsal tomorrow in the afternoon, and then we perform it tomorrow night, which means we have to, each theater is slightly different, so we have to make that adjustment, um, spacing it first. Make sure that it it looks the way it should look. So we will take you know most of the day tomorrow to do that and rehearse uh, first class and then rehearsing and then going into the performance. Um, make sure everything worked and uh, the tempos are going to be right and, and uh, the costumes are going to not fall apart. And <laughs> but it's it's something that I will have to oversee all day long, you know. And then I I watch. I would say I watch probably a good 90% of all the performances we do. And that includes Nutcracker. <laughs> <laughs> We're so sorry. <laughs> so, but that's, you know, I think it's important. Um, 
want dancers to know that I'm in the theater, um, that I care enough to, to be there to see them dance, and because if I'm not there, what's wrong? Why, am I, why, why is Helgi not here watching me dance? It, he doesn't like me anymore. Or, mm -hmm. you know, think, dancers are sometimes rather insecure. <laughs> no. <Which we're> <laughs> uh, I think we have time for one more. Yeah. yeah. It occurs to me that the choreographers have not traveled with you. So how does that work for you to get votes for ballets that you did not create? Or well, back in San Francisco, I assigned one of my ballet masters or mistresses to each of the works. And they are in charge of keeping it uh, rehearsed. And, and if other people have to come in, teaching them hard. So the ballets are really kept up to standard what they should be. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if one or two of the choreographers won't show up during this week uh, <laughs> just to, to check it out. But um, that's normally never a problem with us. You know, we, and they trust us to do that, so. Mm -hmm. Yes. We can't do it, yeah. <laughs> Things. Yes. I grew up in uh, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, first ballet experience was at the War Memorial, mm -hmm. watching your Nutcracker. Every year we did that, so thank you. <laughs> Christmas to me for many years. Okay. <laughs> um, and second of all, do you find it difficult to not have favorite dancers, or are you allowed mm -hmm. to have favorite dancers? And does that kind of make it more difficult in promoting people? Uh, let me put it in another way. You have children, many children, and you can't say that's my favorite child. It's the same thing here. You have to treat everybody with respect and equally and, and try to help them with their careers and everything. And of course, you can't be helped as human beings. We, we like certain things better than others. We go to see a performance of dance or a play or a, or a movie or whatever. And, um, yeah, I mean, there, and then there are principal dancers that are, are extremely gifted and, and, and versatile. They can go both from the classics to the contemporary. So they maybe get used sometimes more than somebody who cannot do that. But, um, that's a difficult question for me to ask because I've hired every dancer that in the company. Uh, so they're sort of all my children. <laughs> <laughs> Just one last one, yes. Um, one of the things that you had said was that, it's, it's specifically with the Unbound Festival, is that dance is changing and you wanted to see all of the change. I'm sort of interested in hearing what are the changes that you sort of see that you are excited about um, in the ballet world at large? And what are some of the lessons from past ballet choreographic and dance traditions that you feel you're saving potential sad that are being left behind? Um, I think what's, what I see less and less of is choreographers using what I call the classical technique idiom, um, that they tend to shy away from it uh, for whatever reason, but what I mean by changing is the young choreographer today, the world is changing, there's different music, they listen to different music, they see different things, and all that influences them in a different way than, let's say, Balanchine grew up in St. Petersburg and uh, Petipa, and, and he used to yes, like he said, I took, he took Petipa and twisted around it, but he was influenced by that. Uh, today, choreographers are influenced by so many things that are happening in our social media, and uh, that can't be helped. Uh, their music choices, whatever. Um, in general, they, they don't tend to go with the, the Tchaikovsky or, or Bach, or, or you know, some do, uh, but it's more contemporary music and more um, rhythmical sometimes. So it, it's just. They are influenced by the time they live in. I think that's what I'm trying to say. And the times we are living in now are changing a lot. Mm. And it's bound to spill over into dance. And that's like, you know, I'm not saying it's better than before or worse or anything else. It's just that's what it is. But I think they have done some beautiful works. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, I, th- I think that's it for us today, that's unfortunately. Okay. Uh, we could stay here all day, yeah. but um, we have to let Helgi go. <laughs> thank you for joining us so much. It was much. very nice being here. Really. Thank, and you thank you so much. It's for coming very out. nice and intimate. Too. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this week. We are excited to announce that you can now listen to Conversations on Dance on Spotify, in addition to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or through our website at conversationsondancepod.com. Subscribe now to receive notifications of new episodes. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Conversations on Dance. See you next week. <laughs>